So, hey everyone, welcome to our kind of like an official mask club. Um, so, my name is Aya, you can also call me Anika. I'm a sophomore here. I like mass, philosophy, and ukulele. Um, so, today I'm going to talk about a few games. Um, the first lecture would not be like very crazy. We're gonna get to some measure theory later. We're gonna get to like continuum hypothesis later. But today we're gonna have like a little introduction. So we're gonna mostly talk about like finding games. Um, so yeah, if you notice any like like bullshit I wrote at the uh, at the board and it's like not right, just like tell me please. And if you have like any questions or I said something like very quick, you can just like always say to me like. I don't buy. Uh, so yeah, so infinite games. Um, they were like systematically studied by Ernst Termella in 1913. So if you don't know who Ernst Termella is, he was a German mathematician, a very famous logician. Um, and like, he is a person who has this like uh, termella frankel axiomatic set, like set theory, you know, uh, like they made some particular axioms that people use nowadays. Um, and also, he's author of, I guess, author of Will Order in Theorem. Um, so, yeah, so he was like studying games like, for example, chess, or checkers, or even Go. Um, and so, when the, co like, the topic sounds like very cool to me, because it's something like, about games and about infinity, and I like game theory, and I like infinity, uh, maybe some of you can just like ask, I mean, why would you need that? It sounds like like something you cannot apply too much, but actually not true. It can be applied to set theory, it can be applied to topology, uh, and real number continuum study, for example. Um, so, so let's for a second think about any game that has two players. So, um, for example, chess. And let's modify it. So we make a like we make a statement that in this game there always should be a winner. So so for example in chess there can be situations when you have a draw. So let's modify chess, like introducing a rule something like if there is a draw, the first player wins. Or if there is a draw, like uh, the taller person wins. Or like I don't know, just like anything you want, like the cuter person wins or whatever. Like, I mean, it's, it's math, you can do whatever you want. So, and when you modify the game, so that there are always a winner, such games are called some zero games. I mean, because there's always somebody who wins, and always somebody who loses. Um, okay, so let's also ask for another important feature, is that they should be perfect information games. What it means is that you should always be able to know um, what move did your did another player like do like the entire game? Like in chess, you see all the moves of your opponent, right? So you can make a valid judgment. So like all the moves like should be open to everybody. Um, okay. So also we would require it not to have any randomness. So no dice, for example. Um, okay. So it's like um, no. Randomness. Um, and then also, you cannot go simultaneously. So, like, it's not like rock, paper, scissors. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, like, and there should be like the first player going, the second player going, and etc. So, like, they take turns. Okay. Um, so basically, you didn't miss anything. We just said that the, uh, like the games we look at should always have a winner. Should all should has have no details of uh, no random mm, elements, and people have to take turns. Like two players have to like go after another, not simultaneously. Okay. So now we understand the, how the game looks like. Um, let's think about are the games we usually play finite or infinite. So, a, a question. Is chess a finite game? It is a finite game with infinite possibilities, almost infinite, like a large number of possibilities. 
Uh, sorry? It's it is a finite play, but it has a large number of possibilities. So a lot of work will take for each and every single one. Uh, yeah, even if it like, even if it has a lot of like possibilities of stations, it can still be finite. Yeah. Like I mean, so yeah, as we know in chess, there is a rule like if the same situation happens with the same player for three times, that's a draw, right? I, I guess I'm right. So if we count it, so there are 64 squares on the board, and there are 32 figures, right? Okay, so this is the maximum number of configurations. Like, if you know a bit of combinatorics, you know that's actually not very accurate, but we don't care, because we just need to find it, it's finite. So it can be as big as you want, just find it. So, okay, so our number of configurations is less than this, then you, you have like three trials not to repeat the same situation. So that's three multiplied by 64 the power of 32. And you have two players. So that's two. Okay. So any number of moves on chess would be less than this. That means that the chess is a finite game. And you can do like the same thing with like some other games. I guess most of them will be fine. Um, okay, so yeah, sorry. Um, now let's talk a bit about notations. I mean, I know that some people hate notations, and I do hate notations too, but we'll need them on the further lectures, so please forgive me. Um, Okay, so let's say that W is a set of natural numbers. Set of natural numbers. And okay, uh, how many people here know what is a Cartesian product? Uh, there are two separate planes. Sorry? There are two planes kind of product. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, uh, you can say that. So, for example, a Cartesian product of, say, set A, B, and uh, that's how you say Cartesian product. Cartesian product uh, and C, D. Uh, it would be the set, um, oh, sorry, you, you make it like that. Uh, a, C, then A, D, then B, C, and then B, D. So yeah, when it comes to like a Cartesian product of like two real lines, that's plain. And you can actually do that like a lot of times. So if you take this, say n times, you would get like combination of n any natural numbers. That's uh, understandable. Okay, um, so we would have noted like a, a, a sequence of that, S1, S2, S3, Xn. Okay, so does anybody here understand that um, the number of moves you do during a game is a natural number? And so if you would uh, give to every position its own number, say for example, like a position like a starting position would be number one, another position would have a number two, and etc. You can actually decode a sequence of in which the game was played with natural numbers. Okay, right? So like you can just like write something like one, sixty-four, two, and it would like show you how the game was played. Okay, and this sequence would actually lie in this set. Like, because if, if n is a number of moves made in the game, it lies in the set. Okay. Um, so, that's pretty all we need for the beginning. And then the set, the notation we need for the future is another one. So, let's say that g and a. So, 
it is a sequence of the game when you had two end moves. So you can write the game as like first player, second player, x0, y0, x1, y1, and etc. So that would be such a sequence. Um, and A, A is a winning set of the first player. So, uh, for example, we know that the uh, first player wins when the game went like that. So A would be all the possible sequences of the moves when in the end the first player wins, okay? So, um, if the sequence lies in the winning set A, that means that the first player won the game. If it doesn't lie in the set, it means the second player wins the game. Okay, that is okay? Sure. Um, okay, do we have any problem with this notation? I mean, I guess it is equivalent to what we were telling before. The only problem we have is that it has to have two end moves always, and then maybe not something we would want, because to end would be some constant. So like, what we can do is we can say, we counted that 2 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 64 and 32 is like the maximum possible moves. So let's just say that to end is bigger than that. And then when somebody would win, say for example at x1052 position, he won or she won, we would just fill in the sequence after that with zeros till to n, because we can do that. Okay, so now the notations are equivalent, and I can stop all the boring shit and come to the actual cool stuff. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, So, graphs. Um, yeah. Okay, so does everybody know here what a tree graph is? Tree yeah. graph, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me just explain. Imagine that you have a first vertex and uh, each vertex here on the plane would be some configurations of, uh, like, of the figures on the chessboard, for example, at a specific time. So even if this vertex and this vertex have the same configuration, if that was like earlier than this, that still would be different vertices, okay? Okay, so we had a starting position, and then the arrows would be the edges. So it means if we have an oriented graph, it actually doesn't matter too much because we would just assume it always goes in one direction. So uh, the first layer does the first move. He has this move that are available to him or to her. This positions, and then after that, from this vertices, a second player can do some other moves. Okay, so and we would just like continue the graph like that. But we already counted that chess is a finite game if we modify it. So the graph would be finite. I mean, it would be enormously big, but it still would be fine. Um, so, uh, that is called a tree. A tree is a graph without cycles, so it wouldn't have stuff like that. Like, it would just like always go down. But from a tree, you can get to uh, any vertex to any vertex. Uh -huh. No, you can't actually. actually okay, and when you have an oriented graph, you cannot, but you can have just a. No, no, like non connected ones cannot. But, like, no, but, but tree is always a connected graph. Uh, the, the, no, like, tree like, is. Like, like the bottommost leaves, they can't get to each other. No, they can. Like, that's a leaf, that's a leaf. Now, that would go, go against the direction. I said in non-oriented graph, okay. Uh, this uh, is non-oriented? No, in like in usual trees, you can get from one vertex to another vertex. It's just in this tree, you because it's oriented, you right. cannot. Okay. So, um, yeah, so as Samuel pointed out, the uh, 
the ends of the branches are called the leaves. That means they have no vertices under them. Um, okay, so um, can you understand that we can actually represent a lot of uh, games, especially all the games we just like looked at, using a graph? Okay, great. Um, and now let me just uh, introduce another concept that is called a strategy. Like, do you know what a strategy means in game theory? Uh, sorry? The moves that you can do to maximize your own advantage. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, to be more specific, you don't just maximize uh, your benefit. You, uh, strategy in maths would always lead you to a win. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, if you're not familiar with what strategy in a game theory is, let me just give you a random problem from game theory so we can look at it a bit. So imagine you have a round table, um, and then you have a lot of coins. Say maybe infinite amount of coins. And so the first person can take any coin, put it on a table. The second person takes any coin, puts it on a table. You cannot put coins on each other, okay? And you cannot put them like like that, just on the table. So. Uh, the, the point of the game is simple. Whoever doesn't have a move, like whoever doesn't have like, enough space to put the coin in, uh, would lose. So uh, maybe I can just like give you several minutes so you can think about uh, who in this game can have a winning strategy and what and what it can look like. Just put one in the middle and do the symmetry moves. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Lancelot tells us the first person is doing this thing. That's actually like a, a very like core problem in game theory. I, I mean, like everybody who just like studies it for like about one day probably knows the problem. So um, you put the first coin in the center, <coughs> and when a second person is doing his move or her move, what what you do is you just copy the move um, using the central symmetry of of the table. So it is kind of understandable that whatever a second player has a move, he would always have a move. Okay? So, one day second player just runs out of the moves and you win. The so symmetry here is like, uh, the strategy here is like going symmetrical. There are different other kinds of strategies. Um, but what we need from here is to understand what actual strategy is. So uh, imagine a strategy is an algorithm that you give to a computer. So it should be like very specific. You cannot tell a computer, please do a smart move. Like, cause computer doesn't understand what a smart move is. So you, you like, or imagine somebody really cannot understand what they're doing. So you have to ensure that wherever they follow your instructions, they can always come to a winning position. So, um, when we look at all of that, so now we know what a strategy is, we know what a tree graph is, let's try to think how can tree graphs help us uh, find strategies in finite games. Um, so let's draw, draw a tree again. Um, Okay, do you want me to give you some time to think about how we can find strategies using like free graphs or you, you just want me to like go right into the solution? Uh, okay, sure. So, um, so we have leaves in the graph because it's finite, so that's what's so great about it. Um, and we know exactly that in which position somebody won, right? So for example, here the first person wins, here the second, here the first, first, second, second. Um, okay, so let's just look at several cases. For example, this is a winning position for the first player, and um, it was a move of the first player from some other position. 
So then that means that this move, uh, this position was also a winning position for the first player. Why? Because he was the one who chooses the move, and he can always choose a position that is beneficial to him, that lets him do a winning position, right? That's a winning position too. Okay, so now let's look at a situation when we had a second player moving, and for some reason the move was to here. So if there was a case that a second player had a move, but all available moves to him or her were winning for the first player, it means that this position was also a win position for the first player. And if we, if, if we ever come to a situation when a second player had a choice between uh, winning for the first, uh, a win position for the first player and winning position for uh, himself or herself, then this is a winning position for the first, uh, second player. Yeah? Okay, so we can just color the graph beginning from the leaves identifying which vertices are winning for which player. Mm -hmm. And someday, we're just gonna reach the first vertex. And it will be colored in one of the color. Like, it would be either winning for the first person or for the second person. And let me just stop here and let you realize what this means. Like, you can, you have an actual winning strategy in chess. Like, can you imagine that? Because that's awesome. Like, if somebody would ever be able to identify all that graph, like, the chess wouldn't make any sense. Like, because there's a winning strategy. You can just use it and always win. So, um, and this applies to a very large class of games we just identified. Like, every game it is, Finding has two people, doesn't have random elements, and like doesn't t it, it takes turns. Like, and we know a lot of those games. So you all have a winning strategy. Like, and that is kind of amazing and sad at the same time. So this was a weak statement of the Gale Stewart theorem. Basically, it says that um, for any finite game that is like has specific like axioms or features that we all get identified, it would have a winning strategy. Okay, uh, just a question: uh, Can we have two winning strategies like for both of players? Possible. Possible. No, no. because winning strategy always like leads you to a win. Yeah. And we uh, said we have no draws in the game. So like, if you have a winning strategy for a first player, and then for a second player, it means that they both win, and that's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is always one winning strategy for one of the players. Okay, so um, that is what we are going to talk about. But more. Are you, are you can do a winning strategy from a further point in the game, let's say from uh, for example, let's say uh, player one is uh, starting with its winning strategy, and five moves later on in the game, uh, we identify another strategy that is to take it for player two. So, what if player two continues his strategy, his winning strategy, from that point on? So. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, I guess that we have like a different definition of a winning strategy. So, winning strategy. So we start. Like yeah, it's like you you always like you would always win if you start with it. Like so by definition you would not arrive to any part when you can lose to the second player. But I mean yeah, I, I see what I see where you come from. Like I guess yes, you can do that actually. I I mean if you if you define strategy as just increasing your benefit in the game, I guess you can come to a point like when you were winning and you were losing. But if you define strategy as um, like something that always like make you win, then you cannot have the situation. Okay, so um, we actually came to that point 
earlier than I thought. Okay, so a little preview to what we're gonna do uh, on next lectures is we're gonna see what an axiom of determinacy is. So axiom of determinacy is a very cool axiom. It's like, okay, so we saw that all finite games uh, have a winning strategy. But you can understand that for the infinite graph, you don't have this kind of proof. Because some branches may not just like have an ending. So, because we cannot actually prove that, let's just invent an axiom that would tell us, um, so guys, there is a winning strategy for any infinite game. Um, and then we're gonna look at how you can apply this axiom to get some really cool results in, for example, continuum hypothesis or anything else. Like you can actually prove that uh, all sets are Lebesgue measurable. And if you don't know what Lebesgue measurable, that's okay. I'm gonna explain what it is. Uh, but that's like a very cool stuff. And why we did it today is I just wanted to, to like get a feeling of what determinancy is because we're gonna use it in infinite games, so it's better to have some intuition about how it works. And now, I'm gonna just waste my last minutes uh, proving you this thing, but like, in a more official and formal way than I just did. Cause like, you could have seen that the way I formalized my proof was not precisely accurate. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna write you a very formal, formal logical proof, and if you don't like it, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, let's understand that the statement um, first player wins is just equivalent to this notation. For any x0 there exists y0, that for any x1 there exists, oh my god, uh, mm -hmm, blah, 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 blah. Um, such that the sequence, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so if you remember the board notation I was telling you in the beginning of the class, that's why we needed it. So, uh, this is the sequence of the game. X are the positions uh, that first player made. Y are the positions that second player made. That was how the game was played, and A is our winning set. So, if we would always have um, an answer to every move that the second player is doing, uh, then we are in a winning set, right? So that's just all what it says. Okay, just, I'm sorry, I actually forgot to ask about it. Is everybody, does everybody know what this means? For all. Yeah, for all. For all, and this means exists. Okay, so this is a statement first player wins. Uh, now, how about we say, okay, so let's look at the negation of the statement. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's not said, I'm a secret. For a player has a winning strategy. I mean, that's kind of the same, but still not. Um, and now, uh, first player doesn't have a winning strategy. So this is just negation of the statement, so we can write negation for any x here, there exists, Okay, that's a negation. We're gonna play with it a bit. We're gonna do this. Um, uh, okay, so when you apply a negation to for all, so um, not for all, uh, it actually is going to is going to have this uh, statement at the end. There exist such x0 that for every y0, there exists x1 that for every i1. Um, and the negation would 
reach the statement, and we just would have x0, blah, blah, doesn't like in the limit set. So basically, it tells us there would be such a specific sequence in the game when it wouldn't lie in the winning set. And this means that this specific sequence is a winning strategy for the second player. So second player has a winning strategy. Okay, so what we just saw is you either have the statement, so the first player has a winning strategy, or you have its negation true, right? And if negation of this statement is true, then it would lead us to second player has a winning strategy. So you always have either this or this. That means you always have a winning strategy for one of the players. And that is all I have for today. Thank you all for coming. Ever. I'm kind of nervous. Oh, good. <laughs> really good.